Hey guys, it is week 77. And uh, if I seem a little more agitated or my hair looks crazy or I look like I just, you know, chopped up a bunch of bodies and threw them in a river, it's because I just screwed up and I deleted the whole video. I already shot everything and I deleted it. <sighs> so this is take two. Hope it's better. Uh, maybe I'll get worse. I don't know. But uh, I have some reviews for you. Uh, I am going to take a glance at my notes a little bit. Maybe I'm going to I'm gonna look at my notes sometimes. I usually just free ball it. I think maybe if I look at my notes, I'll be a little bit more thorough on some of these. And I want to remember everything. Especially, you know, some of the titles, you know, you watch a week uh, previous. So I want to be a little bit more fresh. Maybe it'll work. Maybe it won't. Let me know. But, uh, you know, I have some reviews for you. I have, you know, some questions and whatnot. The usual stuff. And don't let me forget to ask you guys a new question. I keep doing that. I keep doing that. Um, I will not do it this time. I already did it once, but I won't do it this time. But uh, let me hop into this. Uh, the first movie I want to cover is Halloween 2018, the brand new one. Everybody's talking about it. Everybody has their take on it. More important people than me, of course, more important takes. But uh, I just want to talk about it a bit. I'm going to try to be spoiler light. There will be some minor spoilers in here. First and foremost, I want to let you know, I don't have this attachment to the Halloween franchise. A lot of people do. I have it. Uh, you know, I liked it as a kid. I li just like any other kid would like a horror movie called Halloween and how it was a good movie. You know, I had that attachment to it. I liked Freddy more as a kid, but I do appreciate Halloween. Everybody does. I rewatched Halloween one to get uh, keep it fresh in my mind because I hadn't seen it in almost 15, 20 years. So I went in and uh, I hadn't seen the sequels in even longer probably. But 2018 Halloween. Now, you know how Halloween, it's time, you know, uh, the timeline is completely screwed. Same thing with Texas Chainsaw. But uh, this is a direct sequel to the original 78 version 40 years later. So we have uh, Jamie Lee Curtis. Um, she's basically a shut-in uh, recluse. She's a, a recluse, but she's a grandmother now. She has, you know, there's three generations of Strodes. And uh, she's basically, that's where she is. She's a shut-in. She's waiting for Michael Myers. She's kind of the survivalist. And Michael Myers has been incarcerated for those 40 years, and he hasn't said anything still. Uh, the... Michael Myers is played when he's not wearing the mask by Nick Castle, the original shape, which is cool. Uh, let me get into this. I'll, I'll do some positives and some negatives, and maybe I'll be a little bit more brief than I want, you know, than, I, than I'm going to try to be, but I probably won't be. Um, I really like Jamie Lee Curtis in this. I thought her performance was really good. I thought it was a strong performance. I thought it was an emotional performance. I liked it. Uh, you know how she's kind of this survivalist. Remind me a little bit of Linda Hamilton from Terminator 2. I also liked how it was shot. It was shot well. It was uh, made well. It was a well-made film. Uh, I like how they handled their minor characters. I thought their minor characters were really well done. There's a couple cops that pop up in here. The little kid being babysit. Very funny. Very likable. All the characters are at least decent. Um, I like this minor character that is working in the graveyard when she shows somebody Judith Myers' grave. I like her reaction to everything and this whole big, you know, uh, take on true crime. True crime is very popular nowadays. There's lots of, you know, you know, uh, minor sleuths or little detectives or people out there, criminal investigator wannabes out there, and they, they kind of talk about that a little bit in here. And I love the her, uh, you know, reaction to it. Her just. Why do you guys want to see this grave? It's just so silly to these people, and I like that. It feels realistic. And like I said, it, it sheds a lot of light on these uh, you know, these minor characters, and you feel bad for when they die, and that, that's good. That's good. Uh, the score is good. Of course, it's John Carpenter. We always have that. Uh, and, and like I said, that, that's all good stuff. Uh, like a, there's a wonder in here that I love that I'm not going to spoil. There's lots of shout outs to the originals that a lot of people that love these movies will get more than me. I've seen a couple here and there that, you know, were undeniable, but, uh, there's a couple in here that I think that other people will, you'll, will see and enjoy. Um, one, uh, some things I didn't care for. There is a, there's a void called Dr. Loomis and, uh, they try to replace him with this new doctor. Don't particularly care for the actor. Don't particularly care for the character or anything he does. In the Exploding Heads, which I listened to, I call him Turkish Loomis. That's pretty good. He is like a Turkish Loomis. I don't like his character arc. I don't like his character. I don't like his uh, performance. It's just very weak. And it reminds you of Loomis. And it, it's just like, do you not have Loomis? They try to have little parts and glimpses of Loomis and voice and stuff like that. But this guy, is it doesn't work for me. I do like Will Patton. He plays a cop in this movie. He's a good actor. He's a solid character. But I don't like how they try to tie him into the original it's very tropey it's very trite and cheap it's very tropey like well i was there to arrest myers and the red it's like ah, i don't feel like it's needed i feel like it'd be better and just more powerful if he's just there 
Like, there's also a, another cop who's like kind of a cowboy, kind of almost use you. Yeah, he's a decent character, decent actor. He's just underutilized. He reminds me of like how they brought in the like cowboy in town that dreaded sundown, Ben Johnson, or in the you know the kind of weird kind of a. Uh, I don't want to say like meta sequel. They brought in Anthony Anderson. It's kind of like that. It's like, it's just like, he feels like a little out of place with the other characters. And maybe he's supposed to be, maybe he's a big shot. I don't know. He's just underutilized. Um, I, it, there's things, there's some minor plot conveniences, like what kind of kid goes to bed before trick or treating is even done. Uh, why have a guarded fence in your front yard, but then the back is not protected woods and anybody can get to your house. Um, a body kind of, I don't know why it's there and where it disappears to, stuff like that. Um, like I said, there's just minor things here and there. There's a lot of kills in the movie, uh, almost like 15 to 20, a lot off screen. Uh, I really felt bad for like the characters when they were killed. There's a couple gory moments that are pretty decent. I don't really care for how the cell phone is, uh, you know, you know, kind of, uh, written out. It's just really forced feeling. But besides that, I think it's, uh, it's worth your time. I mean, what were people expecting? I mean, slasher movies were never, you know, the best written movies. They have conveniences. That's why, you know, that's just the way they are. They have to be made like that. And there's no perfect perfect slasher movie i mean like they're perfect for what they are but there's gonna be plot holes like that so it is good i did enjoy it a lot of people probably had very high expectations some people had very low expectations i had middle expectations i figured i think it's gonna be good and it was pretty good i didn't love it you know it's good though it's cool i think you should check it out and uh good job on jamie lee curtis's stuff and uh, nick castle's pretty good too um just don't really care for i'm, I'm gonna say it there's exploding head set at turkish loomis but and I like that name. It's funny. He reminds me of a poor man's Herbert Lom. He's like in there doing a bad Herbert Lom the whole movie. But check out the trailer. I don't even, I didn't watch trailers. So at your own risk, check out the trailer. I've waited for him. Testing one, two, three. We're on. We're here to investigate a patient that killed three innocent teenagers on a Halloween in 1978. He was shot by his own psychiatrist and taken into custody that night. And has spent the last 40 years in captivity. Hello, Michael. I have something you might like to see. Everyone in my family like turns into a nutcase this time of year. Yeah, I mean, your grandmother is Lori Strode. She was almost murdered. Wasn't it her brother who murdered all those babysitters? No, it was not her brother. That's something that people made up. Do you know that I pray every night that he would escape? What the hell did you do that for? So I can kill him. crashed. Mom, what bus crashed? Michael escaped. Excuse me, somebody's in here. Hello? waited for this night. He's waited for me. I've waited for him. Get out the room! Get inside! You don't believe in the boogeyman. He's here! Michael! You should. Can you close the closet door? Okay, guys, the next one here is uh, one from Netflix, uh, 2017, The Ritual. And uh, I tried to watch this a while ago, and, uh, you know, I wasn't getting into it. I was like, man, these characters are like the Hot Fuzz, uh, not Hot Fuzz, um, at World's End group, but just boring. They just bored me to death. It felt too, um, you know, by the numbers, like, oh, I do this and that. But 
I went back and visited. I knew it was a good movie. I could tell. Like, it's well shot. It's well made. It's well acted. Everything. It's well scripted. And uh, the characters are good. It's just that they're a little bit hard to get past at first. They're, they have an exterior. They feel a little bit too realistic. And, uh, you know, like, they have their shields up and stuff. But when the movie progresses, they kind of wear down and you kind of start to like them. It's about four friends that go on uh, this uh, hiking thing in Sweden or Norway. I can't remember exactly. And uh, it's very cold. It's kind of a hard hike. And they go in honor of their friend who passed, who suggested they do that trip. And that, that, uh, that's a rough patch with these people. Something's happened where one person did something. Maybe that's a little suspect. So there's that rough patch in there. And they decide to go on this hike and somebody gets hurt. So they take a shortcut through the woods. Bad mistake in a movie. It's, and that's when the psychological horror kicks in, the supernatural horror kicks in. And I like that. I prefer, you know, a lot of the psychological stuff that all these people, they stay in this house. That's very wicker man, very wicker man and pagan and stuff like that. And I like that too. And it gets, comes more wicker man later on. And, uh, I enjoy that stuff. And, um, uh, I like the psychological stuff that these grown men all have their problems, all have these things. And, and, and there's some scary moments through that. And, and then they start to see the supernatural elements in place. And that's good too there is some decent gore in here uh, some kills and uh what happens to them after they're killed is pretty graphic pretty pretty twisted uh i ended up liking most of the characters and the two characters that make it the longest are the ones that you actually are the most interesting so that's nice as well and uh the ending is, is pretty cool uh i like the lead in the movie he's a haunted character he's also pops up in stuff like hot fuzz is more of a comedic character he's pretty good in this this is a well-made movie with uh uh you know it, it's a kind of a cool uh, creature feature psychological supernatural pagan horror movie and i would recommend checking it out especially if you have netflix you ain't got much to lose except an hour and a half Rob would have loved this place. He's a good man. The best of us. You know what they have? Walking trails in England. Pubs. Come on, man. Where's your soul? Ow! Oh, oh, it's twisted. It's twisted. Oh. All right, yep. Oh. Easy, easy. Look, we go southwest through here. We cut the journey in half. Or through the forest? Yeah, why not? I should have gone to Vegas. Oh, you'd have found something to fall over in Vegas too, mate. Now, is it me, or is it really quiet in here? It's been gutted. Could be hunters out here. Or bait, possibly. Or it's the bit they don't show you in the nature documentary. It's a warning. We shouldn't be here. Where the hell are we, Huts? We should pitch the tents. This is ridiculous, man. Luke, you're getting soaked. Did you hear that? No, I didn't hear anything. Come on. It was a nightmare, Phil. Well, what happened to you then? We got spooked and we had bad dreams, all right? I woke up last night. Look, look at this. Nothing has done that to you. You've done it to yourself. Why do you have to deny everything like that? Because I, say? I do not value your judgment. We need to be working together, man. Okay, guys, uh, the next one is from Arrow Films. This is Torso from Sergio Martino. Yes, the uh, legendary Sergio Martino. He directed tons of uh, movies and a couple giallos, um, you know, uh, Case of the Scorpion's Tale, All Colors of the Dark, some other movies like Your Vice is a Locked Room, and I, only I have the key. Uh, the Big Alligator River, Hands of Steel, Slave of the Cannibal God. He's kind of like a journeyman Italian director, but he has a lot of talent behind him. Uh, a lot of his films were actually produced by his brother, uh, Luciano Martino. And Sergio's still alive. Uh, 
he's pretty old, but he's pretty sharp still in the interviews. Uh, Torso follows the story of this, uh, these murders that are happening on this college campus, and these four girls decide to kind of go out and stay at this cabin, and of course the killer targets them. This movie has all the things that make a giallo good, but also, uh, as they say in the special features, this is very much so a proto-slasher as well. You know, 1973 uh, is right after giallo boom in 70, 71, so, but it also is right before, you know, the slasher kick in, uh, in the early 80s, but, you know, getting started with, like, Black Christmas and Halloween and all those things. So we have uh, right in that, that sweet spot, definitely a proto-slasher. We have the, the voyeurism, you know, the, the point-of-view camera stuff going on. We have the Italian zooms that we all see, this, this, this stuff that makes Giallo so cool. The Italian zooms or Italian films in general, the zooms that will be through blinds and they'll go through something or the foreground and they'll cut through stuff, like making really cool, unique shots and saving money, too, at the same time by not switching all these different camera angles and setups. So that's always nice. I uh, love the camera work in Italian movies. We have, you know, the lesbianism angle, the hippie angle, the J&B bottles, all this kind of stuff. A nice score. Uh, Sergio Martino did not like the score. He said it was too French for his taste, but I really enjoyed it. And there's a scene where a character actually plays it on the piano in the movie. Love that too. And uh, they slow it down a little bit at times. I like it. Like those little motifs of the score coming back and slowing it down to speed. I like it. It's cool stuff. Um, there's some gratuitous gore for what it is. You know, some eyes getting poked out, some cuts with a saw. Uh, there's a crazy day for a night scene in the woods. Really like seeing that. Um, <laughs> just because what happens in it. Uh, the day for night's obviously day for night. Um, and it's weird in these movies. Like the late, the early 70s still had a bunch of hippies in it. Like nobody got the memo from 1969 that Charles Manson ended the hippie movement. You know, some of these movies might have been in production and stuff like that. But then you see the evil hippie and like I drink your blood and stuff like that. But still, it's like lots of hippies in the early 70s still going on. Maybe the news wanted to paint that picture or something. Or they wanted to paint the picture of the hippie movement completely dying in 69. But it wasn't out. There's still a bunch of stuff or maybe just movies were way too late to catch on especially foreign movies i don't know wasn't alive back then but i should just guess um but besides that there's lots of nice stuff in here tons of nudity tons and tons of nudity it's very 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 sleazy and lots of people having sex and whatnot and hooking up uh that's enjoyable in this movie like i said um and I like the killer's motives, uh, and I like the flashbacks what the killer has, and with these weird doll things, I like that stuff. I like the interview with Sergio Martino; it's good. He talks about what inspired him to make this movie and uh, stuff like that, and the, and the features they do that as well. Kel, Kent Ellinger does a commentary where he talks about proto slashers and how Sergio Martino was better than he got credit for, and I agree, along with the likes of Umberto Lenzi and Ruggiero Diodato. I mean, they're never going to be as good as Mario Bava, Lucio Fulci, and Dario Argento, but. They are, they're, they should be recognized a little bit more than they are, if you ask me. And a lot of these guys, too, like Lamberto Body and Antonio Maraghetti, they're just better than uh, they get credit for, I think, a lot of times. So they're like the B team instead of the A team with the three big ones. But uh, it's nice to hear that commentary by somebody who's uh, very academic. And the whole disc is very academic before that. A lot of smart people talking uh, about the movie and, and their takes on there. And there's some other things in here too. Like I said, I love Sergio Martino's daughter on here talking about making a remake of this and has a lot of good ideas talking about going to college with Eli Roth and stuff like that. Interesting, smart person. Uh, liked to li listen to her talk and I like her ideas for the remake. Very cool. Um, Ernesto Godaldi, the screenwriter, always mispronounce his name he had some interesting things to say some funny things to say about dario how he if he were to make the sixth sense how they made it so spoilers for the sixth sense how they made it so brilliant with bruce Willis sitting with his wife how they never actually interact he's like dario would have screwed that up by making them shake hands or something and cheating like that and i thought that was funny because i was having a conversation with jeremy about ten and bray about how they show the plane leave and i know dustin hates that too but then nobody actually that guy's actually not on that plane and it's very bad uh vid visual uh you know um mislead it, mis it misleads you a very vi video uh, visual mislead but I don't mind that but and that was funny for him to say stuff like that because Dario does do that sometimes and uh well, it's just not, nothing that comes to mind exactly, but that one for sure does. And he's like, Dario would have had him shake hands or something and screw that up. I thought that was very funny. Uh, but in this movie, there's uh, Ernesto does do something like that. Uh, there's a scene, the Carol, killer, you know, has his fetish, his fascination with dolls and, uh, you know, mis misogyny with the dolls and painting women as dolls and um, uh, kind of dark stuff for sure. And uh, they go in this uh, room and there's all these red herrings. There's like five people that could be the killer in this movie. And as it progresses, you kind of, you know, start to pick it down to one or two. But one of the characters has a doll and you're thinking, huh, it's like, and then 
without spoiling too much, it's like how many people would have this weird fascination with dolls that are like also like misogynist and great. It's just, it's a little bit too much to believe. And that's definitely one of those things that mislead you big time. But uh, it's a good movie with lots of good features on there. Just a, a, a movie that has all the good stuff about Giallo's, but it also has a little bit more things like the final girl and stuff. And I like how uh, Sergio came up with the plot, you know, having heard these two stories about this woman being trapped with a killer in the room or four women being murdered. And then he also had this story that he heard about a, a father and son, this father taking his son to the park. Meanwhile, he left him there with an ice cream and would go upstairs and hack up this body of his uh, father and mother-in-law and get rid of them. And it's just like, that was also part of the story here. But it's a it's a nice release of a pretty good movie that uh, is, is well worth checking out for sure. Next time, Hanson. Ciao, Bella. <laughs> <laughs> A filmmaker with a lot of warmth, I guess, in, in a way. Uh, he had a great sense of humour. Mi aveva colpito, uh, mi aveva colpito il fatto che avesse uno stile. The psychosexual reasons for the killer being the, the psychosexual murder. You got a whole lot of naked women. How do you bring that past Bruno Nicolai? You have to see another time in the movie. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I don't remember what this is. Yeah. Okay, guys, the next one here is by Arrow Films. It is 12 Monkeys by Terry Gilliam. Um, you guys are uh, familiar with this one. I believe it was made in, what, 96 or 98? I always get confused on the year. 95, okay. But uh, the movie takes place in 96. Well, sort of. It also takes place in 1990, and it also takes place in the future. What, 2035, I believe? Bruce Willis plays this character who's like a prisoner, and he's sent back into the past to try to stop this biological, you know, uh, apocalypse that is brought on by this plague. So that's the plot of the movie. Um, Bruce Willis in here gets to a, a better range than he normally does. Uh, Bruce Willis, you know, sometimes feel like he was typecast. And I used to love Bruce Willis. And I saw this movie that came out, but I was way too young to understand it you know, time travel and science fiction and psychological stuff. I didn't really grasp it. I just was like, there's Bruce Willis. I like this. And there's Brad Pitt. Okay. Um, that's pretty much what I thought when I was that age. But, uh, it's just nice to see Bruce Willis kind of dive in and have these different parts to him. It's like a love story, but it's also he gets to do some of the action thing. But there's this moment where he hears this music that brings him back to his childhood and his eyes light up. And he's like, I love this song. And it's a really good performance by Bruce Willis. Really very entertaining. The love interest is Madeline Stowe. She's pretty good in it. Brad Pitt is, steals the show when they're in the uh, 1990, when they're in this insane asylum. And, uh, you know, it's very one foot of the cuckoo's nest. Really well done scene. He has this wonky eye. He does really well in that scene. That's a really good performance by Brad Pitt. Uh, but, you know, this movie plays with the timeline with Bruce Willis. Is is he getting messed up from being sent back all these different times in World War One at one point? And it's messing with his brain and changing everything. And it, Or is this really happening? They kind of try to play with that. But to me, I always felt that it was one thing. And uh, I know that that's not necessarily what the, the, the vision was going for. I like the sets in this movie, especially in the future. They feel very homemade, but of course they also have that distant, cold feeling that a lot of future things have, but they feel homemade at the same time. I like that. Um, 
and, and I like that other characters are coming from the future into the past and talking to Bruce and how they have this number that they have to call and all these things. It's interesting in that aspect for sure. And how these characters are meeting uh, Madeline Stowe over 1990, 1996 and stuff like that. It's a pretty cool movie and it's well made and uh, well shot. And Terry Gilliam's a madman. It's his most approachable movie for the mainstream, but uh, it, it's a unique as well. And uh, there's, there's some misleadings here and there. And there's also this aspect of seeing your own death when you're a child as an uh, you know what I mean and playing into dreams and it's re kind of a remake of this French film but uh, well worth your time uh, very interesting there's some special features on here like a making of that Terry Gilliam shot because he didn't want to be accused of screwing up a movie like he was for Brazil our Adventures of Baron Muchausen and stuff like that you know he has a history with uh, bad things happening on a movie set and he wanted to document it so that's interesting you get to see stuff with Bruce Willis on here and uh, the you know the people actually seeing the movie and disliking it and then it coming out and everyone loving it I like seeing that stuff but uh, Terry Gilliam is a madman and he's a new auteur or Artur, or whatever you call it, uh, his movies are always different and have this weird uh, fantasy science fiction element about them, but also can be strangely dark. He's kind of a one of a kind filmmaker with stuff like Time Bandits and Brazil and Adventures of Baron Muchausen and Fear and Loathing and you know Thailand. He's just so different and unique. And uh, I'm not the biggest fan of Thailand, but I enjoy those other movies quite a bit, especially Time Bandits and Brazil. Uh, just a very unique director. This the features on here also include uh, Appreciation, which is nice to see by uh, somebody I, I can't think of his name actually off the top of my head, and I should give him credit. So so Ian Christie, so that's nice to see. I did watch that. So yeah, there's also a commentary with the director and the producer, and there's a point in this movie where they were talking in the making of, and one of the guys didn't pick up on the ending, and neither did I, and then when they said that, I was like, duh? And uh, that was also very cool. So this one would probably um, you know, benefit from more than one viewing. 12 Monkeys from Arrow. Looks good, sounds good, good stuff. <laughs> Just show them around, tell them the TV rules, show them the games and stuff, okay? How much you gonna pay me? How much? I'd be doing your job. $5,000, my man. That enough? $5,000? I wire check to your account as usual. $5,000. $5,000. $5,000. You know how to get out of here? <laughs> <laughs> yes, my son. This is the first day shooting on Brad. He arrived after uh, months of tr preparation. And he exploded this day. He was yeah, just extraordinary. He, it, it was it was wonderful. Do you think that as the credits roll, the audience will have figured it out? Growing up, I always thought you know, Ingmar Bergman, all these great directors, how they must work with actors, and and I could never work out how you did it. The, the Brad Pitt's vocal performance, well, his whole performance in the film is absolutely extraordinary. Great idea. It's great. But uh, more of a long term thing. Um, first, we had to focus on more immediate goals. I didn't say a word about you know what. Mm. This is my territory, bitch! Is this real or is this one of my delusions? This is definitely real. The next one here is Beware the Blob, a.k.a. It's not a blob. Uh, made in 1972, uh, the original Blob, made in 1958 by Jack Harris, was, you know, pretty much a cult classic, Steve McQueen. Uh, it's cheesy, and, you know, it's dated, but it's cool. The 80s remake, at, what, 86 or 88, uh, Blob, I've Always Loved Myself. And this is the only one I hadn't seen, the sequel to The Blob. And this one is strange. It's got a nice big cast of, uh, you know, actors that everybody would rec recognize. Dick Van Patten, Sid Haig, Burgess Meredith, tons of other people, uh, Garrett Graham. This movie is the silliest thing ever. And while watching it, uh, Jeremy was watching part of it, and he said, man, is this whole thing improv? Listening to the commentary, the story and commentary, it is improv, and you can tell. Uh, a lot of the actors are having a good time, like Dick Van Patten, he's like the leader of this Boy Scout troop, and he's just like, come on! And there's this really goofy thing where all the kids are playing with this the uh, equivalent to like a spinner or something like that back in the day, the little weird balls that connect. And it's very funny, he gets very annoyed. Lots of off-the-wall stuff like that, lots of dumb reasons why the blob is released, and lots to just people being stupid but genuinely likable for the most part except Sid Haig who's kind of a crooked mean cop but it's fun it's silly and I actually like the commentary says you feel bad when people get eaten by the blob like it's funny to start this goofy movie right off the bat they kill a kitten and you're like 
And this, this already sounds silly. It's already got this goofy, wonky, silly music and you're going to kill a kitten. Okay, that's what we're going with. I feel bad for everybody who gets killed. Uh, there's there's just like weird scenes where it's like, we're going to go here with these characters and kill them. We're going to go here with these characters and kill them. Uh, like there's a barbershop scene that's pretty funny. All this kind of stuff. And everybody's uh, a cartoon. Everybody's loud. Everybody's silly. It ends in an ice ring. It works well. You know where it's going. Uh, the blob was frozen before. So yeah, <laughs> it leaves open-ended. It's open-ended. Where's my sequel to Beware the Blob in 1980? I wanted it. Or 1975, the son and the son of the blob, or beware the blob has become a blob again. I don't know what title they would go with, but it's a silly improv movie. It has a lot of crazy nonsensical scenes. It shouldn't be taken seriously. Uh, if you just, you know, kill some brain cells, you'll enjoy yourself for sure. <laughs> The Blob is back in a horrifying new adventure. And you are there, startled, stunned, terrified, as the blood-red creature rolls over and eats everything in its path. We're going to burn the place down. I can't take any chances. Beware The Blob. Starring Robert Walker, Gwyn Guilford. First thing you do when you get home, you go fishing. You know that's not the first thing I did when I got back home. Beware, Godfrey Cambridge. Beware, Carol Lindley. Please, please, please. Beware, Shelley Berman. You would like a haircut? Yeah. Be four hundred dollars. Beware, the Blob. Larry Hagman and his pals tried to stop the Blob with a pitchfork. Beware, the Blob. Consuming human flesh on contact. I don't suppose you got any identification. Nothing can stop it. Not fire. Not water. Not even bullets. What do you mean? Huh? That thing. That's it. Oh! oh. oh. See Son of Blob. Oh, it's the Blob! Okay, guys, the next one here is the VHS Voyage, and it is Shrek from Video Outlaw. Remember Video Outlaw, guys? I do. Uh, Shrek. This is a 1993 shot on video. So right out the bat, looks like crap, sounds like crap. And this one is it's pretty low budget. But with shot on video, you can get away with it if you got a great story. And does Shrek have a great story? Yes, it does. Shrek is the story of uh, these three obsessed, like, kind of horror fans that are obsessed with this serial killer. Uh, one lives in his old house. For, he uh, was, um, you know, his, his time came to an end in the 50s. He got his name, the character Max Shrek in here. He actually took it from Nosferatu, um, who, was the, who was actually the lead actor in the movie, was Max Shrek. And not, not much is known about him, and not much is known about the character of Max Shrek. He was an ex-Nazi who took his name from that vampire, and he uh, was a serial killer in this small town in the 50s. And uh, he was caught, and uh, that's pretty much the thing. He lives in this house, and the main character makes money off people coming to visit. And uh, there's this cr true crime aspect into it, which I really like. And it reminds me of something like uh, people would do with the Ed Gein car. And, but it, if the Ed Gein house was still standing, it would be the same thing. He actually had shot this video in this movie about like a promo where he tells the story of Shrek. And there's this great moment how Shrek gets caught, how this uh, this woman, this girl, was like with a uh, put a tin hat nailed on her head with like a hat nailed onto her head with nails in it. And she gets to the phone and it says Shrek Death House and that plays into the movie in the end like the whole timeline and I like it a lot how they did that um, so what happens is these three um, dummies decide to do this weird uh, uh, golem thing where they dress this suit up and put a gas mask and a helmet on and all this Nazi memorabilia and they're like we're going to try to bring back Shrek just screwing around uh, lo and behold it works and the one it does happen it actually is one of the best scares in the movie two friends are in there and they walk into the room and the, the, the golem or the, the is gone and they see him out in the, in the yard, and they're like, oh, what? And they're like, wait, it's our friend. Where is that? That's so stupid. And they turn around, their friend walks in, and they're like, oh, no. They're like, who's in that then? And then they realize they have brought Max Shrek back. But start, strange things start to happen where 
they start to go back in time into the 50s where they were in this house at the time and and Max Shrek's ghost that they brought back and Max Shrek himself kind of come together as this weird apparition thing and it's like both of them together and uh, he starts to raise these weird like slaves that are like these ghost sheets and they're like they must be victims of Shrek that were never found but I don't think it's that I think it's a little bit different than that and it's very unique and, and it's creepy in that way and like I said it's time travel and it starts to play with you know the history of it and they start to play into it a little bit and at one point one of the characters takes the sheet off to look and I have a theory but I'm not 100% sure or if it's, it's obvious I'm not sure if it's supposed to be obvious but that plays into how Shrek is caught and the phone call and everything like that and maybe they had changed the timeline and become part of the timeline but it's interesting in that aspect it's a good story and like the first 10 minutes get past it you'll be like oh this is catching my attention it, it, I mean like I said the sound's bad and it doesn't look particularly great but it's a good story and it's creepy and I think it, it would be a really cool remake to be honest because it, it's one of those movies that was held back by its budget constraints it just even visually and audio uh, audio wise people will be like no that's junk but I, I think it's worth pe- checking out for sure I think it's pretty cool and I think it's interesting and I like how they play with the timeline and, and weird things happen and Shrek Death House that's all I gotta say cool stuff man cool stuff what are we gonna later right now my new tour tape's done let's go inside oh, let's fire it up Roger Drake, and I live in Max Shrek's house. Wisconsin. Small, isolated, most would say boring, except for the townsfolk. But whatever opinions of praise they would have would be too dull to listen to. This is the last place on earth you'd expect to be the location of one of the most bizarre crime sprees in history. But life and death are ironically ironic. May 13, 1958. Sheriff Herman Milk awakes as his telephone bell shatters the peaceful bite. The mysterious caller says three words. Death. Shrek. House. These are believed to be the dying words of Karen Krasnowski, a Harvest High School senior. Milk rushes to the sea. He arrives in time to send the madman Shrek to hell with a bullet in his brain. But it is too late for Karen, who is found in this basement. A helmet of nails has been forced onto and into her head. This turns out to be the most pleasant aspect of Shrek's torture dungeon. The place is a reeking charnel house of death. Here stood a stove in which Shrek incinerated the torn and twisted remains of his victims. Here was found a pile of bones and skeletal remains, a grisly jigsaw puzzle that added up to at least 11 victims. In the anarchic aftermath of Shrek's discovery, Questions lead to more questions, and answers lead to more questions. To neighbors, Shrek seemed a private, rather sad, immigrant man. Imagine their shock upon finding out he was actually a Nazi madman. It is not known just which death camp Shrek hung his helmet at during the war, but it's clear from the findings in this house 
that he had hands-on experience in carnage. We don't even know his real name. His alias assumed from the actor who played Nosferatu the vampire in the German classic. There's a line in the movie Taxi Driver. A man takes a job, and that job becomes what he is. Max Schreck's job was death, and it became him. Well, what did you think of it? I laughed, I cried, it became a part of me. The film wasn't that cave. I wouldn't pay five bucks for it. Oh, no way. Ah, uh, you're just jealous. Yeah, sure, no, dude. Okay, the next was the Pick a Movie, and this was by Matt Brown. This is 13 uh, Tizametti or Tazametti, I'm not really sure. This is a French film. It is black and white. And at first, I didn't read the back. I didn't see a trailer, so I would go in it that way. So go watch it and then come back. I'm not going to spoil too much, but I am going to tell you the plot. So, but here's what happens. Um, at first, it's like a black and white movie about this roofer who's working at this drug addict in his girlfriend's house, and and this guy, um, the drug addict, start is desperate for money, and he gets an envelope, and he hears all this talking about some sort of criminal activity where he can make a lot of money. The roofer's interested, obviously, and uh, he somehow steals the envelope. And at first, this movie feels very film noir. I was like, this is going to be kind of like your film noir type deal, and he's going to go and uh, mystery and whatnot because I didn't watch it. I didn't want to know. So. When uh, the kind of turn happens, I was like, oh, no, this is crazier than I imagined. But uh, really enjoyable turn. Uh, so it's really well shot. Like, it feels like a film noir thing. And there's police watching him and everything like that. He gets to this uh, place where he's supposed to go through all these different loops he jumps through. And it turns out to be a game of death. Like, this giant Russian roulette thing where all these people are betting on it. High rollers betting on these 13 people that all have it pinned on their shirt. And uh, they basically have to play this Russian roulette game. One bullet in the chamber and they put it to the other head in the circle. And, you know, they keep going down and down. And the stakes get higher and higher. And what I really liked about it was this... All these people here, they just don't say anything out loud, but they you can tell by their appearance, you can tell by who's betting on them, you can tell by their demeanor, who they are, just by looking at them, and just some small dialogue here and there. You know who they are, their character designs, just and they're all it's just so well how they do it. Like there's this heavy set guy that, you know, it just has trouble standing and, and they're betting for these people to blow their brains out and who's gonna win, but they get him a chair when uh, he asks or when uh, his like um handler asks. I don't wanna say handler, but guy betting on him asked and uh so it's that kind of thing you can kill yourself but we're not going to be cruel to you for no reason it's just a crazy kind of crazy thing like that but uh interesting as hell and there's these two brothers in here that are great characters one's very intense and very intimidating the lead's good too as well but uh it, it's just a movie where it keeps you on the edge of your seat and you want to keep watching more and more and yeah definitely want to see how this thing's going to end and uh and what is in this world and how big it actually gets but it's pretty cool stuff i would highly recommend checking it out uh french kind of uh, french movie well made cool stuff and uh you know it's just i like game of death movies anyway so tu sais de quoi il s'agit je n'ai aucune idée Votre homme est là Oui, tout va bien. Maintenant, il faut jouer le jeu. Je demande aux surveillants de distribuer une balle à chaque joueur. Attention le premier tour va commencer. Je demande au public de reculer. Reculer, 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 encore. Chargez-vous, mariés Levez vos armes Faites tourner 
marier Traguez Levez le chien Tel que l'ampoule, salut On tire Tout le monde fixe l'ampoule Thirteen Samedi. Okay, guys, we're going to get into the pick a movie. Um, I can't remember. Oh, uh, Ronnie Vomit won last time. He picked Clones of Bruce Lee. Okay, I have no. He wanted me to watch some Bruce Ploitation. So if you ever want to be entered in the pick a movie, remember I'm finishing out this bag completely. And then I'm, I already have a new bag started. Only OD6666 has entered, so let me know if you want to be re entered in the bag. Um, or maybe if I draw this bag out. I'll just finish the last couple and we'll be done with the pick a movie if I'm not going to get any names. But uh, let's see who's going to get pulled out here. Extro the Mutilator, my buddy. Happy to see his name finally get drawn out. I love Extro. If you have never checked out Extro the Mutilator's channel, I suggest you do so. He does this just a lot better than me. Um, okay, let's hop into uh, the Q&A. Like I said, if you ever want to be entered in the queue, uh, the, the pick a movie, just leave a comment saying enter me on YouTube, on Screaming Toilet, or send me a message on Facebook. I'll get to it and I'll add you. Okay, um, what do we got here? Uh, Nick Mua. Nick Mua. As an artist, how does illegal downloading piss you off? Uh, you know, if, if it's an impossible to find movie, I don't get that mad. But um, uh, if I ever download a movie or I get a bootleg of it, my rule is when it's actually officially released, I buy it. For the most part, I've pretty much done that every time. Um, you know, a lot of it is ignorance. But people that know exactly how much they uh, like are taking, you know, money, like especially like a, a indie movie that they're bootlegging and stuff like that, and they they know they know better. They're just like you're garbage. You're you're trash. And I mean, I, back in the day with music and stuff, you know, it was. I used to do it before I knew better. When I was like 12, 13, you'd be making CDs and stuff like that. And then nowadays, it's just like you pay for all these music services and it's just like it's always at your fingertip. It's strange. Do you feel the Oscars and Emmys have do evolved into pop popularity contests are no longer about rewarding talent? Um, I never watched the Oscars or the Emmys. Um, but uh, I know Brad Easton Ellison has a lot to say about that in his podcast. And he mentioned stuff like... Um, how basically people are more concerned about political ideology than actually a good movie. And I do think that is true sometimes. I do think that people are just, it, it is popularity contest or try to, you know, uh, making rights, the uh, past wrongs they've done. So I do think that is there, <laughs> to be honest, at times. Like how many times should a Martin Scorsese have won an Oscar or something like that? And then they just finally give it to him for a movie that maybe he shouldn't have won for. You know, it's just politics. Should a biotopic be made during the life of the subject, or is it better to wait till they have passed? That's a good question. I have no idea. Probably till after they've passed. Uh, Ray Carthrode, or Catthrode. How many films do you own now? I have no idea. Over 10,000. What are you going to do with them when they all die? Burn them. I don't know. You know what? I, I thought about that, because I don't want to... Do I give them away to like groups of my friends? Like, you can have all these, you can have all these. Or do I really just, you know, say... Donate them to a library so everybody can enjoy them. Donate them to some sort of places. Is there going to be a time when I'm dead that somebody will be like, this is how a movie nerds used to live with aisles and aisles of movies and then just donate them all to that or just have like some sort of weird kind of public, you know, weird thing. I don't know. I don't know. I'd like to have them be preserved fairly well and not destroy. They may not last that long. Maybe they'll laser rot with DVDs, DVD rot, Blu-ray rot. I don't know. Maybe they'll all blow up in a fire. I don't know. I don't know. But I'd like maybe to have them have some sort of library of them, but a library that takes care of them. Um, I have some answers to uh, some questions. I asked uh, last week, I asked a question, but I got some answers to the week question before that that I didn't get to. They're so late. This is any actor, actress that died before their time. 
that you would like. Uh, Boots and Flicks puts John Cassell past before his time, and he was alongside De Niro, Pacino, and Walken, the greatest actor of that generation, the greatest actors of that generation. I agree. Victor Rose, 1978. I go with Bruce Lee. Could have had a much longer career as an actor, but still a legend. Jay Mitchell Beard says, I would have said to say Marilyn Monroe is an actress that died too soon. She had just a brief time as a star where her acting ability was shown. A director it would be interesting with her, maybe Ken Russell or Stanley Kubrick. Uh, though it would be hard to imagine what projects she would have done, but definitely dramas. Her last completed film was was one. The Umbrown 80. I would have loved for Steve McQueen to have lived longer and making more films. And of course, I agree with John Candy. That's a good one. Nobody mentioned Steve McQueen. Dead at 50. Very sad. Okay, the question from last week was any actor or actress with memorable or recognizable voices. So the one that spots out to you guys. Uh, Nick Mua, ladies first. Uh, Dame uh, Judy Dench, M from James Bond. I adore suave, hoarse uh, voice, never get tired of it. I always recognize it. Lucy Lawless has a very musical voice, love it. Uh, Thaddy Newton, M2, Solo, a Star Wars story. Quite the delicate voice, great at accents. She's a Brit, of course. Out of the Gents, Christopher Lee, but that goes without saying. Wasn't his voice just perfect as Saruman in Lord of the Rings? I could almost always tell if James Duvall is in a movie just from his voice, and a great voice it is. Yeah, his voice is very memorable. And lastly, Mr. Tony Todd. His voice is hypnotic hearing. It always makes me smile or shudder. Nope, two, those last two guys are both in that, what, Sushi Girl movie. Uh, Rogelero, uh, Isais, please, uh, correct me. I, I, sorry. Uh, distinct voices go to Jennifer Tilly, Peter McCain. Not sure about the most recognizable voice, but I love listening to John Goodman. J. Mitchell Beard. Strangely, the first person that comes to mind for voices is Jennifer Tilly. Bride of Chucky. Stuart Little, Family Guy, Monsters, Inc., amongst them. I remember seeing her first in High Spirits. Uh, Peek and Boo. When it comes to actors slash actresses with the most memorable voices, I always think of Madeline Kahn. Just listening to her, her was a wow experience. Great singer and comedian as well. Uh, Toshiro uh, Mifuni. Also got to be up there. Not familiar with that actress or actor. Uh, Peter Engelin. James Mason. Love his voice. And Peter Lawyer. Lori, of course, you know. Uh, Kathy Morarty. Uh, Morarty. Uh, sorry. And Jennifer Tilly. Getting a little dry mouth down here. The M. Brown 80. The most memorable voice of an actor would be L.Q. Jones. Uh, that's a good one. But there's so many more. Burt Lancaster, classic actor, had a voice that always stood out. Yeah, I think his timing is also very memorable, how he times his voice and stuff like that. You know, similar to like a John Wayne. Like, they just... Their voice is memorable, but their timing is also in, is just very memorable, like a walk-in, too. Nobody has timing like Lancaster or, good, or, or, or um, John Wayne or Christopher Walken, the way they do their timing. James Grimmer. Recognizable voices that come to mind would be Keith David, Tony Jay, and Vincent Price. I would also say Bruce Campbell and Christopher Walken. Those are some good ones. You know, if nobody mentioned Keith David, I mean, Keith David, man. He's been doing that for years. Okay, guys, uh, I wanted to ask uh, the question of the week. Uh, this might be shoehorned in here because I forgot to ask it, but... Um, uh, the question of the week for next week, uh, what movie poster taglines just grab your attention that you always loved? Um, the It's Alive one's a cool one that comes to mind. There's only one thing wrong with the Davis baby. It's alive. That's a great one. Uh, race with the devil. If you're going to race with the devil, you better make sure you're faster than hell or you're fast as hell. Love that one. Uh, pieces. It's exactly what you think it is. You don't have to go to Texas for a chainsaw massacre. Come on, just give me some taglines you like from movie posters and whatnot. Let me um, hop into the update, and we'll be out of here pretty soon. Okay, guys, here we are in the update. Let's start this off with a bang. Who made who? Who made you? Love this movie. Very stupid. Everybody always says that Troll 2 is the best bad movie. That is just simply not true. It's clearly Maximum Overdrive. Uh, everybody knows the story. Stephen King supposedly coked out made this crazy movie directed it i'm excited to see it in hd hopefully the prints look better than the other hd prints i saw vestron special features emilio estevez pat hangle let's do this we got uh, savage streets by danny steinman director of friday 13th part 5 code red supposed to have new color correction and new audio john vernon love him the man, John Vernon. Also, has got Leanna Quigley and Linda Blair. Uh, classic rape revenge movie. I think that everybody kind of uh, enjoys this one, to be brutally honest. Uh, if I mean, if you're a fan of that genre, but uh, it's one of the more popular ones, and I, I think it's pretty good. I wish the revenge was a little bit more harsh because they deserve it. Then we have this Mac Daddy, The Twilight Zone, 156 episodes on Blu-ray, every episode. Yeah, this thing is a monster. I got it for a good price. Look at that. So cool. There's special features on these, too. I just dived in and started watching a couple. I haven't seen these since I was a kid, but, you know, great, great actors in these. Just great stories. Just great. Twilight Zone, one of the best things ever made. The Deep. 
Haven't seen this entire movie, but I knew my dad always liked it. Robert Shaw and Nick Nolte. It's also got the guy from um, Hard Times and Longest Yard, the bald guy. It's also in what, Future Force with uh, David Carradine. Awful movie, but very funny. Got Creep Show by George A. Romero from Shout Factory. Finally getting some respect. The best horror anthology, in my opinion. Uh, if, I'm sorry, I like it better than Trick or Treat. I know it's not popular anymore, but uh, maybe it is. I don't know. George Romero, one of the best directors. Nice hard case. Can't wait to watch this. I love this movie. Uh, Howling 2, Your Sister is a Werewolf. Uh, this movie's nonsense, always been nonsense, starring Christopher Lee, Sybil Danning, and more importantly, Sybil Danning's boobs. Probably have more screen time in the end credits than Christopher Lee has in the entire movie. This is nonsense. It's fun nonsense. Uh, <laughs> and probably the best Howling sequel, according to many. Um, Dungeon Master and the Eliminators, another Shout Factory double feature or Screen Factory. I've seen Dungeon Master right over here. It's been a while, but I remember enjoying it. I didn't Buchler do this one, but uh, this is supposed to be a longer cut on the Blu-ray. Ghost Story. Been a long time since I've seen it. Classic, uh, you know, little old school ghost story. Remember uh, a Slow Burn? Remember it being pretty good? It's been a long time. I remember being a little too slow for my taste, but I was very young. Wanted to recheck it out, Ghost Story. Then we have some from the Oliver uh, Sale, The Last American Virgin. Heard this one's pretty good. Not seen it. Uh, it's a remake of an Israeli film, I believe, a sex comedy. Heard it goes a little bit further and has some serious stuff in there that's a little bit darker than a lot of the other sex comedies of the 80s. Uh, Sands of Kalahari, um, Killer Baboons, survival movie, good cast, not seen it, looks cool. 60s 5, I believe. Deadly Bees by one of, you know, uh, this, uh, one of the British guys, is it Terrence uh, Fisher or Freddie Francis? I believe it's Terrence Fisher, those two guys that directed more Hammer movies than, you know, there are uh, days in the year. But, yeah, I'm willing to check this out, like killer animal movies or eco horror. The Sender. Um, again, I've seen this years ago. I remember being very slow, but I was very young. And it just artsy and slow. I don't remember. That's not a bad thing, but it's been a long time. I'm willing to recheck it out for sure. Uh, the Dirty Dozen, The Deadly Mission, and The Fatal Mission, both starring Telly Savalas and Ernest Borgnine. Not seen neither of these. I have seen the original several times. Love it. And these are both TV movies, I think. And then there was a second sequel. The second one that came out was The Next Mission, which had Lee Marvin and Ernest Borgnine in it. I've seen that one. That one's pretty good. These ones have some decent cast in there, so I'm willing to check it out. Love uh, that kind of movie. Uh, Phase 4 by Saul Bass. I haven't seen this in years. I didn't like it when I saw it, but I was a much younger, much dumber person than I am now. Can you believe it? Even dumber than I am now. But uh, artsy ant killer movie. <laughs> it's, I didn't. I just didn't get it. So, uh, yeah, let's check it out now. Then we have High Noon from the Olive Signature releases. Uh, you know, classic Western. I've never seen it. I'm going to, you know, make it right and finally see this one. It's been ripped off dozens of times, so, you know, I'm excited to check it out. And we have Body Double with uh, by Brian De Palma from Indicator. This is one I've always wanted to see. And uh, it got a nice release over here, so definitely going to check it out. And we have the Vinegar Syndrome ones, The Killing Kind. I remember this movie being pretty cool. John Savage in it. Not seen it in uh, a very long time. So uh, don't remember too much, but I remember being kind of like a psychological whore. And uh, John Savage is a good actor from uh, Deer Hunter. Um, Death by Temptation, a vampire flick, originally by released by Troma, with Samuel Jackson. Uh, nice hard uh, slipcover. No, everybody loves them slipcovers. Goes nuts over them. Uh, but yeah, not seen this one. Sam Jack in it. Sexualized slipcovers. That's just my next channel. Just all slipcovers. Incubus, John Cassavetes is in this. Love that right there. That is cool, guys. Uh, you know, I had this DVD. Never watched it. Now I have this Blu-ray. I'll eventually watch it. Heard it. Heard it's pretty good, actually. I've always wanted to see it. Then we have Blood Harvest. I also have the 88 Films version. I've never seen this movie, but yeah. Blood Harvest. Willing to check it out. Tiny Tim. Uh, and last, House Sitters. This is an indie movie I donated to the... Uh, Kickstarter, Indiegogo, J uh, Jason Kaufman reviews lots of movies. This was on Amazon Prime. I checked it out. Uh, burned, uh, burned disc, uh, DVD and Blu-ray combo, but I don't mind. Uh, I enjoyed it. Very low budget, but very funny. Cool stuff. So, back to the video, guys. Okay, thank you very much, guys, for watching. And as always, you have a good one.